everyone I'm Greg here from Greg's restorations going over one of our previous restorations that we did back in 2013 this truck was the biggest project I have ever undertaken with the most fame this is the truck that put Toyota on the map and also put our business on the map I just wanted to show this restoration off with everybody that loves this truck just as much as me This is amazing to be able to actually take out this truck and drive it. I'm like living millions of guys' dreams being able to be able to take out this truck. Thanks to Bill and Patrick for allowing me to do it. We were the guys that restored this truck, so it's it's one of the perks of restoring cars. We restore cars because we love it. We love to be able to have opportunities like this. It's a holy grail. This truck is, it's the first year fuel injection in the last year model with the solid axle. In 86, you weren't able to get this truck with um, a solid axle. You could do a swap, but it's not original. So this is a true 1985 Toyota. It's a one year only option. The independent front end suspension trucks, they ride comfortably, but they're just not as tough looking. You know, it doesn't have that stance of the solid axle. It's kind of neat to be just like sitting here in the original 1985 Toyota pickup from the film Back to the Future. Um, you drive it and it's not even like, doesn't even feel like you're driving an old truck. It's like a brand new truck. I think it's got 240,000 miles on it and it drives like it's got three miles on it. It's just, it's a, such a time capsule. This thing drives like a brand new truck. It, everything on the suspension was fully restored and we got everything we could from the dealer so um, the dealer still does offer a lot of mechanical parts for this truck but um, nothing really like you know body wise you couldn't go buy a brand new bed for it but you can get all um, mechanical parts so as much as we could get from the dealer we did I think it's just, it's so cool. Like, that's an 80s Toyota. It's the who's who in 4x4. Four four. Who could ask for anything more? Toyota. One of the things that I like about movies is it's not the actors, but it's the cars. Like, the cars to me are sometimes more famous than the actors themselves. Every time I watch Back to the Future now, I'm like, I restored that truck. Once in a lifetime opportunity. All right guys, it's about that time we bring this truck home after being able to spend the afternoon driving it around central Massachusetts. The owners, Bill and Patrick Shea, are going to give you a tour of the BTTF barn. Welcome to our Back to the Future barn. Today we're going to talk about one of our favorite items in the barn, and that is our 1985 Toyota that is prominently featured in both parts two and parts three of Back to the Future, and how it all came about. And I'm a person that believes in fate. 
And after we had started our Back to the Future collection and accumulated some things and bought the Part 3 car, which of course is the one that's been featured in many documentaries and uh, been recently seen on the Discovery Channel expedition Back to the Future, uh, we became kind of members of the inner sanctum in terms of Back to the Future prop collectors. And all of a sudden I get an email and a fellow tells me that the truck from parts two and parts three has been found. Not an expert, um, but I have been told a few different versions of what happened to the first movie truck. It is my understanding, based on multiple stories from reputable people, uh, that the truck was raffled off in a joint program after filming that involved California Raisins, Toyota, and Universal Studios. They raffled the truck off, and the person who won the truck actually, after taking delivery of the truck, uh, was involved in an accident, and the truck was destroyed. Uh, hence, the need for a second truck for part two and part three. The part one truck was, was pretty cool. It had well, actually a lot more features than the part two and part three truck. It had tinted windows, it had a Toyo decal on the tailgate, it had a tonneau cover. One of my favorite features of the first truck was those SR5 seats are super rare. I actually have a truck of my own that I bought just because of the SR5 seats there on a Tamium. The original owner of the truck, Mr. Keith O'Brien, he owned a uh, movie studio vehicle lease company. So when the time came for the need for a truck for part two and part three, uh, he had, was contacted and he had this exact truck, which actually was his daily driver at that point, uh, and they asked him if they could use it. And he obviously let them use it, and then once they were done with it, took possession back of it. We were told at one point that possibly Mr. O'Brien had passed away and that his family actually put the truck up for sale. Absolutely unbelievable story. It was advertised on Craigslist for almost next to nothing for a price. But it didn't look like the truck from Back to the Future because the last owner was a Denver Broncos fan and he decided to paint the truck orange and uh, tear out the interior and put in some kind of a racing interior. But you know what he had? It's the thing that always sells me. He had the story. But it wasn't just a story, because people will say, don't buy the story, buy the item. Well, I buy and sell things all the time, and my philosophy is totally different. My philosophy is, I buy the story, but it depends on who's telling me the story and what kind of credibility they have and what kind of documentation they have and so on and so forth. So here was this orange beast that was purchased on Craigslist for chump change, essentially. But what it had in the back was files full of documentation that it unquestionably identified this as the truck from Back to the Future. It had all kinds of receipts. It had the receipts when the work was done, the conversion that um, to prepare it for parts two and three of the movie. I think that cost $13,400. There were all types of leases to Universal Studios because the studio leased the truck. And when they were finished with it, they gave it back to the owner. And the owner had it for a while and lo and behold, he was from California and the truck, the truck got stolen. So he figured, well, all right, it's gone. But after two or three days, the police contacted him. They found the truck, and he got it back. Shortly after that, he sold the truck, and it kind of went into anonymity, and so a regular person bought it and drove it for a while. And lo and behold, the truck had stolen a second time. And it was gone for a few weeks, and by that time, he kind of figured, well, it's maybe in pots now, or who knows what's happened to it. And the guy got a call from the Mexican police and they said, do you have a 1985 Toyota truck? 
And he said, well, yeah, I did, and it got stolen. Well, we have it down here in Mexico. I think it was Tijuana or something. And he, he, he was like laughing about it. And they said, well, do you want it back? And he said, well, what's it look like? And they said, oh, it's not too bad. It's got a couple of dents and uh, we have removed all the drugs from it. And he went, the what? Well, come to find out, literally in the police report, it talks about that the truck had been seized in a drug sting and it was being used as a mule to carry drugs. And of course, it's one of the favorite vehicles used by cartels and terrorists and so on and so forth. So the truck has a glorious and inglorious history. And he decided that, well, it's not in the worst of shape, why not? So he went down and picked it up and brought it back. That was at the point when the Vintag was swapped out on the truck. Whoever stole it, stole it. They actually, to cover up the fact that it was a stolen truck, they popped the Vintag off of the dashboard and put a different Vintag on the dashboard. The truck was recovered. They were able to find the VIN in other places determined that it was what it was, and then it was issued a replacement VINTAG by the Department of Motor Vehicles in California. That is the VINTAG that's on it now. At some point in the truck's life, uh, it uh, had some repair done, and that repair included replacing the backing plate on the passenger front. And uh, at the end of part three, you may recall the um, scene when Needles pulled up next to Marty and Jennifer and wanted to race him. Uh, in one very famous photograph, you can see the backing plate and there's a big tag and it's a Toyota manufacturer's tag on this replacement backing plate. We were very particular about the quality of the restoration uh, so we wanted to replicate that tag and it actually is present on the car now. Maybe a few times when my father wasn't around I may have tried to replicate that scene uh, but uh, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> then it underwent its iteration to become the Denver Broncos truck and and it still was in pretty good shape, ran pretty well. But when the time came, he decided to sell it and put it on Craigslist. But he said, this is the truck from Back to the Future. Well, of course, it's the Craigslist from California, so we had no idea. And lo and behold, we got contacted by some fellows out in California who said um, they had purchased the truck and they weren't really sure what they were gonna do with it. They were in the process of uh, restoring the A-car for Universal Studios, and uh, that was a all-encompassing chore, and many of them had been involved in uh, restoration, and uh, they did an excellent job, and they were just about finishing that up. They weren't really sure if they wanted to take on another major project. So the old cliche, who are you gonna call? So phone rang off the hook after the email and the negotiations began. I knew that I had to have the truck. There was no ifs, ands, and buts. It was just a matter of the price being palatable and knowing what I had to do with it once I got it. I had ideas and a few pretty good concepts of how I wanted it to look in the end. So after rolling around the floor and doing some negotiations, we finally nailed down a price and the truck was on its way to Massachusetts from California. So we have the truck and it runs. We don't want to really show it off because it's not a lady yet, not in its glory. So I began a journey of a thousand miles, seeking out the possibility of getting the truck restored. And I did a lot of different things. I went online, my son Patrick and I spent time looking for the ideal situation where we could get it done the way we want it to have it done and have control over it. So as a matter of fact, I'm pretty good at writing proposals and um, a pretty good negotiator. So I said, what better place to reach out to than Toyota itself? So. I went online, tried to find the right contact person, um, and um, wrote a letter with a proposal. And I said, folks, I have what I believe is the most famous Toyota truck of all time. I have what I believe is the Toyota truck that put Toyota trucks on the map. And I would love to see it get 
a spectacular restoration. And I want to give it to you. I want to put it in your hands. I want you to do this. And, but I want to oversee it. And heard nothing. Didn't hear a thing. So this was the summer of 2013. Every year we set up at what was formerly known as the Summer Nationals. And this was the first year for a, a new organization to handle it. And it was called the Cars of Summer. And this is an auspicious event which takes place in Green Hill in Worcester, Massachusetts, the city where I grew up. And every year we go and we're there for a special purpose. And that is to honor our Vietnam veterans. The Massachusetts Memorial for Vietnam Veterans is located at Green Hill Park. This is hallowed ground. And every year for the last 10 years, Patrick and I and his wife Nikki have set up at the show on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And we encourage people to have their picture taken with props and make a donation to perpetuate the memorial. And this has worked very successfully. And at the same time, there's a great car show going on. And that is where fate once again intervened. So the clients found me by, I was actually taking my 1974 Toyota Land Cruiser to a local car show in Worcester, Mass. My truck was having problems, the front brake, calf, front brake drum was locking up. I was like so embarrassed that the truck was acting up. As anybody knows with antique cars, there's always, they always have some sort of problem. And today was my day to have that problem. There was this beautiful red Toyota Land Cruiser coming down the hill. And I looked at my father and I said, I'm gonna follow and we gotta find this guy and talk to him, find out where he had his truck restored. So, as he was driving by, I noticed the truck said, Greg's Restoration's on the door. So uh, I knew that we had found the person that we needed to complete our project of restoring the truck. So I said to Greg, you know, who did that Land Cruiser? And he said, well, I did. And I said, what did it look like before? And he took out photos of it. And I looked at those photos and I said, that should have been crushed. It was so bad. And then we began to chat. And Patrick happened to have a couple of pictures of our Toyota on his phone. And I watched the reaction on Greg's face, and I was absolutely astounded. It was like the blood drained from his face, and he was speechless. And we told him we were looking for someone to do the job. And I'll never forget one of the first words out of his mouth. I'll do it for nothing the Back to the Future Toyota pickup. And I had about just lost my mind right there. It's like the Holy Grail Toyota pickup. And I said to him, no, 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 no. You're a businessman, you're a young man, and you have a business to run. And I'd like to think that we can come to some kind of a agreement. Pulled in the driveway, they actually had a sign set up for us, welcome Greg's Restorations, and uh, it was under a cover, sitting in the driveway, and we drove up to it, and there it was, in its orange glory. He was sort of speechless. I wasn't sure if that meant because it was going to be a, a really big job or that it was just the idea that he was in the presence of a piece of Hollywood iconic history for the first time. So we weren't in the clear yet. We had to show that we were capable of doing this job. So immediately went back to the shop and I did a full tear down of the inside of our shop and for a, you know, for a tour. So I said, give us a week and then come over and check out our facility. And I cleaned the entire shop, painted the floors, painted the walls, organized the tools, made it like a museum. He was our guy. I was really amazed by his enthusiasm, by his youth, and by the opportunity to take this vehicle and turn it into the diamond that I was looking for. I'm gonna put you on the map. I'm gonna take this item and we're going to do this together. This is going to be a journey that we're going to engage in. We worked on basic antique cars and for local people, but this was going to set us on the map. So I had to knock this one out of the park. We were actually so nervous about when this truck came to us 
that we didn't tell anybody what it was. Friends, uh, we didn't post any pictures because, you know, we were young and I didn't want to jeopardize my reputation and this was going to put us on the map. And it did. It actually featured us in our first documentary on Netflix. It actually gave us a couple jobs from all over the country. Brought the truck in, did an evaluation on it, started the tear down. The truck was painted over its original black color. The truck was painted orange because the, customer, the owner was a Denver's Bronco fan. He changed out the interior to a blue interior. He painted orange because those are those colors. Um, he knew what the truck was. He kept all the documentation, but he he didn't wreck it. I mean, he put a lift kit in it, he changed the wheels and tires, but he didn't wreck the structural part of the truck. The truck was extremely solid. It had no rust. Um, the frame was perfect. There was a lot of missing little pieces, plastic interior parts. It was easy. You know, periodically I had to bring over wheelbarrows full of money, and uh, Patrick was uh, very much involved in the overseeing and uh, supervision, and uh, it was a very positive experience and one that I'll never forget. We walked into a pile of rubble which somehow resembled our beautiful truck uh, and we knew that not only had the found that we found the right people, we also knew that uh, the restoration was going to be done to a very very high standard. We also knew that we had a huge project on our hands. So when we brought this truck into the facility, we tore the truck down. Um, we actually sent it off to a, a local facility and they actually soda blasted it and sand blasted the truck right down to bare steel. When the vehicle was in bare metal, we started doing the body work and started to do a couple little repairs on it. The vehicle had very little to zero rust on it due from where it was living in its climate. So there was a few few parts on it that we had to we had to cut out and replace just with new steel because it was you know tended too bad. When we had everything cut out like that, that's where Eastwood's internal frame coating came into play because we could actually coat all the in insides of the panels. One of my favorite parts of this build was restoring the inside of the bed because that's like an iconic part of the truck that nobody really sees. We actually even built a special tool to take out the dents in the bed from over the years. Marty wanted to take this truck up to the mountains with Jennifer camping. And you know, the sleep bags were supposed to be back there and this truck was supposed to be a brand new truck from back in 85 from Statler Toyota. So when I restored this truck, I wanted the inside of the bed to be perfect. As you can see, there's no bed liner in it. That just every factory spot weld is there. One of the main products that we used on this vehicle restoration was the Eastwood 2K Ceramic Chassis Black Paint. It comes in satin or gloss. We used it on all the suspension and frame components. Another product that helped us with the restoration of this Toyota was using Eastwood's Gold CAD Kit. It allows you to easily replicate the look of gold cadmium plating on the parts and hardware of your vehicle. We could not re-anodize all of the components on the truck because they were just they were already assembled and you could not take them apart to restore them. So this paint kit helped us reproduce the factory look of these components without blowing the budget. All the original hardware is the hardware that we use in this truck. Everything that we took off, we individually bagged, labeled, sandblasted. It was our first time ever doing all the zinc plating on all the hardware. So we bought a whole setup and individually dipped, you know, five bolts at a time, you know, every little station. And uh, it was kind of cool getting it was all done in house. Once the priming stage was done, it went to painting because everything had to be painted completely apart. Everything was set up on the rotisserie and everything was jammed and 
painted. And then we started, then we assembled the vehicle um, partially painted because everything on the inside and underside was painted. So we set the vehicle up in the chassis. For all of our exterior painting, we use Sherman Williams Ultra Series. One of the nicest features that I like about the Ultra 7000 refinish system is it's super forgiving. And I've been using the product for over 15 years and I've stuck with them ever since. Greg called me over and he said, um, come on over and see what I've done. And I said, Greg, I'm, I'm really busy, but if you tell me to come over, uh, then I will. Oh my God, my diamond is coming back alive. It had paint on it and it was I know what spot on is, because I know it in my heart, and it was spot on. You know, 22RE performance in California, this was their first engine build for us, and it was, I believe, one of their craziest 22RE engines they built. This thing's got like a stage three engine, and it's got like the most horsepower you can actually put on this without putting a turbo on it. It's crazy. We knew that the engine had been replaced at one point already. The truck had 240,000 miles on it. As part of its rejuvenation, we wanted to make sure that it was absolutely perfect mechanically. We determined that the gearboxes, transmission, transfer case, front axle and rear axle, were in good shape and just needed refreshing. But the engine was a different story. The engine was very tired, uh, had uh, multiple leaks. So we decided we're gonna really, really give it uh, a special engine. And we determined that 22RE performance in California would be an excellent source as that is what they specialize in. We contacted them. They were very, very, very happy to help and went above and beyond, we feel, to make sure that we got exactly what we wanted. The engine has uh, ported and polished heads. It's fully balanced, has a roll of valve train, a special header on it, a beautiful, perfectly running engine. Another shout out to a company that helped us with the restoration on this truck is LC Engineering in Arizona. One of the major features that we bought from them was the header system and ceramic coated exhaust system. Probably one of the hardest things on that truck we had to restore was the wiring harness. We did not rebuild and make a new harness just because it would it was be virtually impossible. So we repaired and restored the existing wiring harness. Use all the factory connectors if there was anything removed. This truck is 100% factory as possible. One of the questions we are asked uh, on many occasions is how much of a lift the truck had. And the answer is it does not. The truck is factory height riding on a slightly bigger tire. It's a 31, 1050, 15 inch Goodyear Wrangler radial on a US wheel, steel wheel, exactly like they were in the film. Height difference that may be noticeable on film is strictly due to camera angles. Factory replacing parts are hard to get and the aftermarkets that were on it are discontinued. So we actually got into the aftermarket parts business of making the parts that this truck needs, like the factory Toyota windshield decal correct size. The KC front light covers, they are discontinued from KC, but the owner of KC actually sent me a, pair, a ripped pair of them and we, over a friend of mine at John's, we made a, made a replica of it and we silk screened the KC back on it. So we were the first company to reproduce those covers. Reproduce parts for these trucks that you can no longer buy. If you want to check out our eBay store, we have a few things on there for the restoration products that you need for this truck. We have parts trucks, we have parts. Any restoration questions, give us, you know, shoot us an email and we'll go from there. Another cool thing about doing the restoration on this truck is after we restored this truck, I started seeing a demand for these bumpers. Um, because everybody's making clone trucks of their own. Um, also, if you want to have a truck built by us, we can build you a replica of this truck. We call them clone trucks. If anybody wants one built, we can uh, source and build you a truck. Another company that assisted us with the restoration on this vehicle was Inside Out Customs. They are in Lunenburg, Massachusetts. They helped us with the interior restoration. The interior of the truck was in kind of poor condition because the original seats were torn out of it and the dash was painted and all the plastic components, door panels were all swapped out. So we had to buy a parts truck from a local salvage yard around here. And we had to take out the interior and restore that for our truck. Uh, the door panels are actually original to a, another 1985 Toyota. 
They were unrestored, they were just cleaned up. The seats had to be recovered with custom seat covers. Uh, you cannot buy these seat covers from any dealer or aftermarket company. They all had to be handmade. We matched the stitching to something that was close and ran with it. The dash was, was painted another color than it was originally, so we had to match the color with a SEM interior gray. It all had to be sanded and scuffed, adhesion molded, and painted. Uh, it was pretty time consuming because we had to tape everything up and we could not get any overspray on everything. The factory air conditioning still works and blows out cold air. Like it just, you know, driving a classic car, you, it's kind of a necessity. You know, everybody's so used to having it. So it's pretty cool that this truck came with air conditioning. We're not just some restoration shop that just restores cars because they want, they like to make, make a living. Like we dreamed of doing this truck. I actually told Bill that I would do this truck for free when I first originally did it because I was so excited this, you know, this would take my, my business to a whole new level, and it did. One of the most challenging parts of this project was meeting the deadline. Usually it takes about over a year to two years to do a full factory restoration. We had 11 months to complete the project to debut it at the Tribeca Film Festival and the 30th anniversary of Back to the Future. And we made it, it was pretty awesome. When I first started out, my company was just me, and now we have 10 employees. My mom works for me. You know, I get to bring my dog to work. This, this truck has set us to like a higher standard. Like restoring this truck, now I want to make all the trucks that I restore just as nice. 